Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar for CIS 205 Technology and Integration Support. Tonight we will be discussing CompTIA's A Plus Exam 220-802 and the exam objective that's being discussed tonight is 1.6. And the, the actual heading on that objective is Set up and configure Windows networking on a client desk, client slash desktop. So let's go ahead and begin tonight's discussion. And we get to start with home groups. Uh, that is Windows 7. By the way, it was implemented in Windows 7. It is their easy way of sharing resources. In particular, they mention uh, files, documents, and photos. Microsoft actually calls it the easiest way to share. Uh, in some ways it is, and in some other ways it's not. One of the things that I will say is that if you're running Windows 7 Starter or Home Basic, you can join a home group, but you cannot create a home group. Now, a home group is a little bit different than a work group because anybody can join a work group, and a work group is actually networking and not sharing resources. So that's the main difference between a work group and a home group. Now, there are also differences between work, work groups and domains. Uh, the first thing that I'll say is that work groups are easy. All it really requires is knowing the name of the work group that you wish to join and joining. Uh, it is closer to being a peer-to-peer -peer networking, and work groups actually work best in a small network environment, like 10 or fewer machines. And I do say machines because printers count on a work group because they've got to be able to join the work group if you're going to share a printer, a central printer. Uh, another thing about work groups is that if you're using them to share resources between nodes, between computers, each user has to have a user account on the machine that has the resource to be shared. That's why they're that's why they work best in smaller environments instead of larger ones. Just imagine trying to go around to 50 or 60 machines to make sure they have all the correct user accounts on them. Um, I have set up work group networking before, and it's actually a pain in the tuchus to manage. Because another thing that happens is when a user leaves, you've got to go around to all the machines, excuse me, <coughs> all the machines, and take that user account off or disable that user group. Now, domains, while being a little bit more complex, are also a whole lot more secure. And the, the thing with the domain is that there is one central database that takes care of authentication and authorization for all users who need access to resources. Uh, it's a whole lot easier to manage. And that way, when a user leaves, an adjustment only needs to be made in one spot. It's a whole lot easier. And if you're working in a work group and you decide you want to set up a file server, that's great. You're now three quarters of the way to setting up a domain. You should just take that extra couple of steps and set up a domain. Uh, it'll save you in the long run in the workplace. Now in the home setting, uh, home groups and work groups work just fine because, well, in most homes, the the hardware is so minimal, there's no point in, in making the extra step. Now, how do you set them up, a work group and a domain? 
and for that part, uh, home group. There are wizards for most of this. We're going to talk about uh, specifically tonight setting up work groups and domains. So you click on the Start button. Then you right-click on the computer and select Properties. And you select Advanced System Settings. Then you click Computer, computer Name and the Change button. That is the same for both work groups and domains. Now, the, where the difference comes in is in step four here. If you want to join a work group, all you need to do is input the work group name in the proper box, and then click OK, and then reboot the system, and now you're a member of the work group. But if you want to join a domain, then you need to click the domain radio button and enter the proper username and password, and then click OK, and you do a reboot, and guess what? There you are. You've now joined the domain as long as your username and password are correct. So now let's move on to uh, some of the other items that have to deal with networking and network shares and mapping drives. Now a network share is just a resource that is shared on the network. It could be as simple as a file. It could be a space on a hard drive. It could be a whole hard drive or it could be a RAID setup. It can be just about anything that the user needs to have access to. And the easiest way to handle a network here is to map it to a drive. And what that means is that when the user boots up, they have, they have a direct connection to that resource upon boot. Now there are two ways to get access to that network here. And the first one is to know the unique, it's not unique, the UNC, the Universal Naming Convention name. And what that is, in most cases, is that it's backslash, backslash, the computer name that the resource resides on, backslash, and then the share name of the resource that is going to be shared. Now, that can be a kind of a pain, uh, particularly when you're dealing in larger networks or with lots of stuff that needs to be shared. But there is uh, a way to map the drive, and it's real easy. Here are the steps. Click Start, select Computer, click on Tools, and then select Map Network Drives. Select the drive letter that you want to use, or you can let uh, Windows do it for you. This will be the only time that you need to have the, the UNC. So you type it in here. You select Reconnect at Logon. And now you're mapped to that drive, and it will always be there. Even when it's not online, that uh, icon will be there to the map drive. You will get an error if you try to click on it if the resource isn't actually on the network but you still have the connection there. So now let's talk about different types of connections. Now the order that these are listed in here don't make a whole lot of sense, but I took them right from uh, CompTIA's objectives, so you get them in the order that CompTIA lists them. So the first one is, is a virtual private network. Now, a VPN allows for a private connection over a public network. And this is an awesome way to, you, to reduce costs and remain secure. In the, in the old days, before high-speed Internet and before the proliferation of the Internet, 
if you had two sites that needed uh, to be networked together to communicate with each other, in most cases you had to lease a line from the telecommunications company, from the telco. That could be a T1, that could be a T3, it could, be, could have been a fractional T1, but you still had to lease the line. And that meant that you had a dedicated uh, set of wires between you and the location that you needed to be networked with. It was fairly secure, although they could be tapped. It was always on, it was always there, it was very convenient but it was also very, very expensive. Uh, back in the 1980s, uh, we had two sites that were five miles apart. We had a T1 line that, was, that ran in between them, and we were paying almost $1,000 a month for that T1 line. Uh, it gets really expensive really fast, Thank goodness for VPNs. Now with a VPN, you can use the internet instead of a leased line. Even though it's a public network, what a VPN does is it drills a tunnel, an, encrypt, an encrypted tunnel through the internet or through the public net, network from point A to point B. It works really well it's really slick and it's really secure. Um, so how do you set one up? Well, begin from the control panel. Then you select network and sharing. Then you select set up a new connection or network. Then you select connect to a workplace. Click next. Select use my internet connection. This is going to be what, however you connect to the internet. Uh, enter the IP address of the VPN server. That means that you need to know it. Then in most cases you need to use, uh, or you need to input a username and password and the domain, the fully qualified domain. And I put down if required they are usually required, and then select connect. And what happens is there are a whole bunch of different tunneling protocols, and your PC will cycle through tunneling protocols until it and the VPN server can agree on which protocol to use, and then the connection is made, and you're in. It's, like I said, it's slick, it's fast, it's pretty secure. It does require, in most cases, a VPN client on one side and a VPN server on the other. Uh, some of that stuff is free, some of it you have to pay for. All depends upon what route you want to go and what capabilities you're looking for. So now we're going to talk about dial-ups. This is the old days. Uh, requires a modem and an ISP, an internet service provider, that will accept dial-up. Most of them still do, even though they don't advertise it. So what you do is you begin, again from the control panel, this is the setup, and then you set up a new connection, and so on and so forth. The steps are pretty basic, but there we go. Uh, let's see, what do we have next? Next we have wireless. Everybody's getting used to wireless now. Uh, wireless requires the capability. That means that you need to have your node that wants to connect needs to be able to connect. So it might have it built in, or you might have a wireless dongle, or you might have a wireless network interface card built right in or inserted into your machine. And it requires a wireless access point. And that WAP 
needs to have an internet connection, which in most cases means that it's connected to a switch or a router that is connected to the internet. Now to set up a wireless or a client desktop onto a wireless network, you need to know the SSID, the name of the network. Sometimes they're, they're hidden, sometimes they're not, but you need to know the name. You also need to know which type of security is going to be used. Hopefully you're, you are using security. Now, the security that it could be used is WEP, W-E-P, and that's Wired Equivalent Privacy, which is a lie. And if you're still using WEP, um, I'm going to invite you to come all the way up to 2014 and change. WEP has been broken for a long time. Um, unfortunately, some people are still out there using it. It's, it's easy to penetrate, uh, so get rid of it. In most cases, you'll be using WPA2 with PSK. Uh, much stronger, hasn't been broken yet, at least WPA2 hasn't. And it uses different encryption methods. Uh, you do have your choice in some cases. Uh, WPA PSK, the PSK stands for pre-shared key, which means you need to have a password. And that password is encrypted. Uh, that's beyond the scope of this discussion tonight, so we'll move on. The other type of encryption that's out there. Excuse me for one moment. The last form of wireless uh, security that you should be aware of that's out there is 802.x. 802.x is enterprise Enterprise grade, that means it's business grade, it's very secure, and it uses a radius or a, a TX server to authenticate the user before they're allowed onto the network. Um, a lot of the times in the business world, when you log onto their wireless networks, you are actually logging onto an 802.x type security, secured network. So how do you do it? Click Start, and on a Windows 7 machine, click Next, or Connect To. Then you get to select the wireless network you wish to join, select Connect, and then you follow the prompts and enter the proper information at the prompts. Another way to do it is from your uh, tray in the bottom of your screen on the right hand side, you can click on the wireless uh, icon in most cases or the network icon and go that route to connect to a wireless network. So now let's talk about a wired network. Okay, here's what you need. You need a network interface card. You need a NIC. Then you need the proper cabling. Uh, CAT5, CAT5E, CAT6, CAT7. Nobody uses CAT3 anymore. Uh, I never did see an implementation of CAT4. So CAT5 and CAT5E are the most common currently. You need a switch or a router or both. You need to have the proper TCP IP stack initialized. You need that for wireless as well, but I thought I'd throw that in here. And then you need an IP address. And there are several ways to get the IP address. You can either be static or it can be dynamic. Uh, if you're using uh, IPv6, that gets a little bit weird. It's kind of stat static and dynamic both at the same time. And again, beyond the scope of tonight's discussion. In most cases, when you're dealing with a wired connection, 
uh, being able to physically plug into an active port is authorization to be on the network. Doesn't work in all cases, uh, but, it, but in quite a few, if you have access to that port, uh, you're good to go. The cases where it's not, that's when you'll have to use a sign-in, and again, that's that would involve a RADIUS or TX server. The last, um, establishing a network connection that's on this objective is WAN, wireless WAN. That's cellular. And I really like the information on this one. It says you need to be aware of it, but each vendor has their own implementation, so guess what? We don't get to discuss it very much, but you do need to know that it's there. Okay. Oh, I needed to change the, the heading on this one. Um, <clears throat> so now we're going to talk about proxy settings. There are many benefits to proxy settings. Uh, one of the main thing, one of the main benefits to going through a proxy is that it hides the user behind the proxy. Those on the other side of the proxy, all they get to see is that proxy server. They do not see the user. Uh, one of the products out there, and I, I actually took this from their website, is a product called Hide My Ass. And that's exactly what it does. Um, behind a good proxy, nobody knows who you are. Another good thing about proxies is they speed up networks. If you're on a network and everybody goes to the same page every day, that proxy server will preload that page and hold it in cache. And that way when somebody requests that page, it comes right from the proxy. It doesn't have to go through the proxy, out to the internet, back to the proxy, and back to the, the requester. The proxy just already has it on file and sends it right right to the user. In cases like that, the proxy is set up to um, check the page on a periodic basis to look for changes and will update the page as required. Another advantage to using a proxy server is that the proxy will filter the content that's available to the user. That means that if if the user tries to go to a restricted website, the proxy server won't allow it. Now, just about everybody has a proxy server, or proxy software, I should say. They just don't know it. And that's in their web browsers. Almost all web browsers have proxy settings that you can adjust for filtering in particular. Now we're going to talk about remote desktop. Um, remote desktop, one of the products out there that a lot of people will remember is PC Anywhere. That was remote desktop software. It allowed you to essentially uh, log into your desktop from anywhere as long as your desktop was on. Nowadays, you can still do that. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's easier than ever. And you don't necessarily need PC Anywhere to do it. There are a lot of free software packages out there, but you do need to uh, enable it in the Windows Firewall page. And your ability to do it has different settings depending upon where, what network profile you have, home, homework and or public network. Um, remote desktop, if you're on a remote or if you're on a public network, if you've told Windows that you're on a public network, you cannot easily make that machine uh, remote control. You can do it, it's just not easy. 
So now let's talk about the difference between home work and public network profiles. So where your, where your network is does make a difference. You don't want that in the Celeraptor in your network. So how could he get in there? Well, if you're at Starbucks and you log on to their wireless network and then you tell Windows that it's a home or work network, your machine is now discoverable. If your machine is discoverable, somebody can attack it. And if they can attack it, there's a chance that they can get in it. That's where that public profile comes in handy. Public profile makes your PC non-discoverable. It doesn't really broadcast its presence. It can still be found, but dinosaurs weren't very smart. So those not smart dinosaurs won't find you. The really determined ones still will, but not much you can do about that but ensure that your firewall settings are correct. All Windows versions from XP onward ha did come with firewall. Now their firewall is a software based and it is personal and tied to the machine that you're using. There are hardware firewalls out there, but um, again, that's a topic for another discussion. So how do you get to the firewall in Windows XP? You access it from the control panel, and it contains three tabs. On the general tab, there's on, and there's on that don't allow exceptions, and there's off. My recommendation is that it's on. It could be on but don't allow exceptions, or on but turn it on. The exceptions tab, this is where you have some granular control over what you allow in through the firewall. Uh, there are some cases where you do need to allow traffic in before it goes out. As well, I'm going to back up. In most firewalls, if you send traffic out through the firewall, the firewall will allow the traffic back in the return traffic. It keeps track of what goes out. It'll allow the return back in. Now, if it's unsolicited traffic coming back, <clears throat> it'll bounce it, unless you have an exception. Now, why would you have an exception? Well, um, let's say you have cameras at your home and you're on vacation. You want to check your cameras. Well, to be able to check your cameras, in most cases, you've got to get past your firewall. That would be an exception. That's unsolicited traffic into your network. What makes it a little bit more secure is only you, hopefully, know what IP address and what port number is allowed through. Um, the advanced tab is that just that it is advanced now let's talk about windows firewall and vista and newer again you access it from the control panel instead of on on but don't allow exceptions and off we have enable and we have disable and there are some various options in between uh, windows firewall with advanced security which comes with windows 7 allows for even more granular control. Uh, you can really get things down to a fine level with uh, firewall with advanced security. Now let's talk about configuring an alternative IP address. Now why would you need an alternative IP address? Well, let's say you are a laptop user and you go from place to place with your laptop there may come a time when you go to a place that requires you to use a specific IP address 
Now you could just have your, when you go to that place, stop, access the configuration, uh, set it up so that you use that IP address, and then voila, you're on. And then when you leave, you got to stop, you got to go into configuration, and you got to go back to using a dynamic IP address scheme. Kind of a pain in the butt to do it that way. Uh, so Windows allowed for configuring an alternative IP address. And what that does is that means that when you when you go to the place that requires you to use the specific IP address, you will switch over automatically. Now, how do you do that? Well, you go to the control panel. You go to Network and Sharing Center. Then you select Manage Network Connections. Then you right-click on the NIC that needs the alternative IP address. Then you select IP, I, Internet Protocol version 4, so IPv4. Then you select Properties on the bottom right-hand side of the box, or the, yeah, the main box there. And then you select the Alternative Configuration tab. Then you input the Alternative Configuration. And then you select OK, and guess what? You're done. So now let's talk about NICs. OK, that is the wrong NIC. We're not talking about Nicholas Cage. We are talking about network interface cards, NICs. Now, all NICs nowadays are set to a default to run full duplex. In the old days, in the old, old days, in the beginning, they were all set to half duplex. Um, back in those days, they were they all ran at half duplex. Some of them were capable of full duplex. Nowadays, they're all full duplex, but they are capable of running at half duplex. So what is half duplex? Well, your network interface card can send and can receive, but it cannot do both at the same time, which means that it can either be sending or it can be receiving. And that tends to throttle network communication, makes things really slow. What you can think of half duplex like is that you're driving down the road, a fairly busy road, there's traffic going both directions, and then you come to a one-lane bridge. Only one car is allowed on the bridge at a time. Traffic pretty much comes to a standstill. I mean, it still kind of moves, but really, really slow. That's half duplex. Full duplex, on the other, on the other hand, you can send and receive at the same time. It is more like the multi-lane freeway. Uh, there are still some bridges out there, but they're not near as narrow, and, and things just move right along. Now let's talk about NIC speeds. Uh, they have varying speeds that they're capable of, and speed is usually measured in bits per second. That is lowercase bps, and it's bits, not bytes. Bytes per second, which is capital BPS, is a whole different game. Um, there are eight bits to a byte. So, um, trying to think of an easy way to do it, and I just can't do it because my math's not that good because we are talking binary and it doesn't work out exactly. But if I had my choice between 100 bits per second, 100 100 bytes per second, I would take bytes per second in a heartbeat a whole lot more faster. Uh, some NICs are capable of what's called wake on LAN. And what that does is even when your PC is turned off, it still has a little bit of trickle power, and some of that power goes to the NIC. And the NIC is listening for a signal from the network that's going to tell it to wake up. Uh, you see this in some businesses where um, to conserve power at night, everybody shuts off their machines, but they have everything all booted up and everything. When people get there in the morning, there is a 
server sends out a sends out the signal and it'll wake up all the machines that have to wake on to LAN uh, next. Uh, excuse me one moment while I you know, step on my dog's toy and then put my dog away. Sorry about that. Oh, and he's going to be misbehaving. He knows I'm on the phone and doing a recording. He won't go into his kennel. Um, sorry about that. Uh, then we have QoS, quality of service. Uh, this is the ability to give priority to network traffic. This is also called traffic shaping. Uh, you want to use quality of service to improve reliability or the performance of a program. Some programs are mission critical in the workplace and they get a high QoS. Some aren't quite so critical, uh, usually like email, they're given a low QoS. And part of what that means is when a program or a service with a high quality of service rating requests access to the network, it will shut out other programs. One of the main places that you will see it is where they use uh, voice over IP phones. Uh, since since email really doesn't care when it receives its packets, its bits and bytes, it's put on hold. Whereas when you're talking on the phone, uh, a packet dropped here and there can make all the difference between understanding and not understanding. And that concludes this evening's webinar.